All right, this one will be a little bit, little bit more geared towards the aficionados. Um, and maybe more the collector types that might appreciate something like this. I'm not a, a collector. I do have like 80 knives, but, but so I guess I'm more of a hoarder. But I'm not one of those people that buys them. And I mean, I try to use most of them. I mean, there's some that don't make it into my rotation that much. I just got, I just get them because I like them. But I'm not a collector in the sense of, oh, I'm worried about taking it out of the package. And oh, what about the resale value? And you know, I don't care. I'm not worried about resale value. I'm buying them for me because I like them. So you've seen a lot of different knives that I've got. Um, I like the cheap Chinese ones, um, you know, that are cool designs. Um, I like, you know, the Lion Steels, my, my Sabenza alternative here, the MKM Maximo, which is a titanium frame lock. You know, sort of size and shape of, it doesn't look like a Sabenza, but it fits that role in just a basic, nice frame lock, do-it-all knife. Um, but I also have a, a place in my heart, just like I've grown to appreciate revolvers over the years and I'm getting more into lever actions and stuff like that. Um, I, I like kind of the traditional cutlery. The problem is always finding things that I like. Um, occasionally I'll find something from uh, Lion Steel, like um, the Best Man, the Jack. Um, this is their Barlow with their Dom uh, blade, which is a nice sheep's foot blade. M390 Steel, Titanium carbon fiber. Great little knife for around 135, 140 bucks. Um, my Boker cattle knife, uh, N690 steel, I believe. And it's got a little bit of a longer blade, kind of a more blunt point. Um, and unlike the, uh, I'm not going to reprofile that tip like I do on a Swiss Army knife. Swiss Army knives to me are very good knives. They're well made and they'll hold up over time. But you know, I, I I don't call them disposable. They're not gar they're not garage you know guards uh, gas station knives by any means. But you know, I'll I'll reprofile that tip a little bit. But on something like this, that's two hundred and fifty bucks or whatever the hell I paid for it. I'm not gonna do anything like that. Um, not as much because of the value, just because oh, it's a nice knife. I'm just gonna appreciate it for what it is. So love that with the uh, the birch uh, handles. So you know these are the kinds of knives that I like when I go traditional. Um, Case and some of those other knives, you know, I've got them, but they're just, to me, the American-made knives just aren't that great, you know. German, 250 bucks. Italian, 140 bucks. Um, my Rough Rider Reserves are actually very nicely made, and you can pick these up anywhere from 33 bucks on sale up to about 50 or 60 bucks. And these blow away anything Case has got in the sub-100 market. And then you get to a company like GEC. Now, I like these guys a lot. Why? A couple reasons. One, the quality on the, the Great Eastern Cutlery knives is top notch. It is every good as good, if not better, than the two hundred fifty dollar Boker. Now the Lion Steel is probably quality wise probably on par. I think these are all on par, but I think the fit and finish on the Lion Steel is a match for Great Eastern Cutlery. But it's a step up from this, and it should be. You know, uh, this one is the Remington Bullet Knife that was made by Great Eastern Cutlery. Um, I think it's 1095 uh, high carbon steel. So you do need to wipe it down and keep it clean. Otherwise, it will start to get pitting and rust. That's probably the only downside that I have um, with these blades. Is I know that's the traditional knife steel, and I understand the versatility and the toughness and edge retention of that carbon steel. And over time, it'll probably get a patina, but it does take a little more, you know, TLC to keep them looking nice. Um, I'd rather see a stainless. See if you look really close right there, you'll see. Apparently, I got something on the blade and didn't wipe it off and didn't even realize it. I've only carried this knife two or three times, and it's got a little staining. Now, it doesn't hurt anything. It's not on the edge where, you know, any kind of corrosion would hurt it, and you can't even feel it, so it's not like a rust. But, you know, there's, there's a little bit of staining there. They say it's normal, so I, it doesn't keep me from buying it. It's just a personal preference I would like to have. Um, you know, something a little bit more, you know, it sits in your pocket. I live in Atlanta. You get sweaty. Sweat has salt in it. It's moisture. You, there's maintenance that's required in these things. So anyway, what are we here to talk about? Not these knives, because I've already talked about these ad, ad nauseum at some point. I was able to get another one, a really cool one. And that's what we're here to talk about. Now, these are normally hard to get. I never see vent online retailers with these in stock. I've been looking for GEC knives for some of their their, their uh, styles that I thought were really cool and I wanted to get one. Nobody's got them in stock because the collectors buy them up like Beanie Babies. 
um, when Old Town Cutlery, which is where I got this over in Cumming, Georgia, you know, when they announced, put in the newsletter, hey, we got a shipment of GECs coming in, there will be guys camped out for an hour before the store opens with two, three, four thousand dollars in cash in hand, just a handful of cash to buy up anything they can get their hands on. I don't know why. I, I don't know if they think it's going to be, you know, an investment. Whatever. I buy knives because I like knives, not to put them in, you know, not to put them in wrappers in hermetically sealed containers, um, you know, so that, you know, when I die, <laughs> whoever's going through all my shit's going to say, oh, look at all this stuff. Hey, let's sell it on eBay for half of what it's probably worth. So I just actually like the knives. So they didn't advertise these on their website. They're not on there. You can't buy them online. You got to go in the store and say, hey, you got any GECs? And they're like, sure, we got four of them over here. And they got a couple, not just four, they have some in stock, but they got four models sitting right there. So I went and picked up one of them. So let's open, let's open the top or the bottom. Where's the damn, do do Come on, all right. So we can do this without cutting myself or anything else. Come on. There we go. Sealed very well. Nicely packaged. And what do we got when we open it up? Keep these out for comparison's sake, for size and all that stuff. Um, there's a button. Don't care. <laughs> I know the, uh, the collector guys are like, oh, you gotta do it. Don't care. Oiled wax paper. So what is it that we got? So this is a Great Eastern Cutlery, but I guess they've got like sub-brands or something. So this is Tidiote? Tidiote? I, I don't know. I don't know how you pronounce it. It's this. That's what it is. Name's there. Name's there. It's called a cattle knife. What this is, is 1095 carbon steel. This is made in Titusville, Pennsylvania by Real Craftsman. So it looks like nickel silver uh, bolsters. Really nice springs. We'll get in the transitions, all that kind of stuff. The handle on this one, uh, is this jigged bone or is this, there was one blood jigged bone. Okay. There was one that had Delrin. I guess I didn't get that one. I got the one that's actually bone. So what did I get here? Well, this is basically a stockman pattern as far as the blades go. So it's a spear blade. So it's a combination of a couple things. It's a canoe-shaped handle. Um, we'll go over the, the dimensions and stuff in a minute. Um, but what we've got is a spear point blade. So, you know, decent piercing without being crazy, but really nice sharp blade, nice fl uh, flat grind. We've got that one, little swedge up top, so should be good for piercing and things. Very generous nail nick, uh, almost like a fuller on one side. Makes it very easy to open that. Up, as opposed to some of the bokers. This one's not as bad, but it's got such a strong spring. But having that fuller, that really long nail nick, that it, it almost feels, well, that looks more like a fuller, but this looks just like a long nail nick. Um, but on some of like my, my boker trappers, if your thumbs are short, like if you happen to chew your thumbs, the thumbnail the day before or wore it down or whatever, your thumb just slips out. You actually struggle. It takes you two, three, four times to get the damn blade open. It just... It, the, the spring is so tight, you just have nothing to grab onto. And that's where knives like that, especially that's got it on both sides, boom, there's a shelf there. It just grabs your fingers and instantly, I've never had a problem opening it. In, even though this has a really stiff spring, it's great for a slip joint. That's a really secure, nice positive spring. So this has a very nice positive spring and it's got that long nail neck. I still struggle just a wee bit, but that'll probably loosen up and you know break in a little bit over time. So you got your spear point. You also have a small spay blade. Wipe some of that excess oil off with an oily rag. So we're not gonna wipe it all off like with alcohol and then have to worry about the staining or pitting. And then you've got your sheep's foot. So you've got all the blades that you would typically get on a stockman. The difference being it's a spear point instead of a clip point, which I'm fine with, because I think a lot of times the, the clip points are kind of goofy. They're just a goofy shape. I actually prefer the spear shape. So you've got your three blade design with your spade blade, you've got your uh, sheep's foot, and then you've got a spear blade, but it's all in this really nice canoe shape. 
You've got your red jigged bone. Pins aren't proud, everything feels good. Springs really nice, did a really good polish job. Your transitions going from bolsters to, to the horn, really, really good. You can feel it there. It's not so good that you can't feel it. That's something I feel like these guys excel at for whatever reason. But maybe that's the difference between the materials, using micarta instead of bone. Maybe bone just has natural variations where it's hard to get that transition as smooth. But this is among the smoothest transitions I've felt. Um, really nice. You really can't see where the pins are placed. So they did a really good job of making sure that the metal, it's the same type of metal and polishing it properly. You really can't tell where the pins are. So very good there. Um, one thing that I really like about these is I'm looking at the blade. I've snapped it closed a couple times and I'm looking for any edge damage you typically get with Stockman designs. It's a flaw. And maybe that's why they use this blade shape in the canoe shape so that it could be just a little bit taller. But they also do a really good job. I forget the terminology, so someone more knowledgeable than me will probably chime in. But there's the spring and where it meets against the knife. If that's tuned properly, you don't need stop pins to keep your blade from smacking into the spring. If you don't know what I'm talking about, let's open all the blades here for a second. Be very careful because these shot knives are sharp. All right. So when you look down in there, see that kind of point, that hump? That hump is there because where you have that pin, which is what holds that spring in place, well, if you just drilled a hole through the, to the spring, the springs are very thin. Like if you were to look at them like through a microscope, they're only like, they're not that tall. So in order to get enough material in there, so when you drill a hole in and mash a pin through there, you have enough material all the way around that doesn't crack or break or come loose or anything like that. So they have to build in those humps. Problem is with those humps, a lot of times, when you let the blades snap into place, the blades come in over really strong spring pressure and you don't see it going up and down, but it actually over travels a little bit and then the spring pushes it back up. That happens instantly, you don't see it. You probably have to have like high speed camera to, you know, to kind of see that. And then what ends up happening is you end up dinging your blade. So I've got a bunch of cases. Um, one, of my, my, one of my Rough Rider reserves, um, no, actually the Rough Rider reserve doesn't do that. Um, and that's because they have stop pins. I, actually, no, I'll take that back. There's one. There's one that I have that looks almost like a giant Barlow, but it's a three-blade design with a big spear point. That one does because the way it's a three-blade design, they don't have a stop pin on the big blade because there's blades on either side or something like that. So that's the only one of the Rough Rider reserves. These all have stop pins down in there. And that keeps that blade from going whack and snapping against that spine, that spring, and putting a sizable ding in your edge. And the result, uh, you know, their, their advice is always, well, if you sharpen it enough times, you know, you're going to you're gonna have to you're going to have to fix that. And eventually you'll wear away enough material that you've worked the edge of the blade back a couple thousandths of an inch so it no longer hits that. That to me says, oh, I got to grind away my blade to fix an inherent design flaw. No. So I have not had that problem with either of my GECs. Um, this one particular from Boker, see this the problem, see how many times I had to try to open it? And I have a thumbnail. They just don't do a good job. It doesn't really catch. It's too rounded. It's hard to get on camera, but it's like the top edge should be at a 90 degree angle from the blade, not angled. So if I look in it this way, it should be like, straight to back so there's a hard 90 degree edge it's not this edge goes in at a 45 degree angle so you get your thumb on there and your thumb just wants to skate off of it and it makes it really hard that's that's actually why i don't carry this blade that much because it's kind of a pain in the dick to open it i love the shape of it i mean it sits in your hand it's not that heavy it's beautiful it's elegant it's got a decently sharp blade it's a nice blade really nice good for slicing food prep cut rope you know whatever it's, it's just a really nice beautiful knife, but they drop the ball when it comes to that. Having such a strong spring means all that pressure on your thumbnail and your thumb just skips off of it. And there's not enough of it there to really, I mean, you can almost pinch it, but again, you got to make a very concerted effort as opposed to having a lot of blades sticking out. And you just, boop, I don't have to look at it. I don't have to pay attention to it. Do it with my eyes closed. Every time you grab it, your finger automatically indexes and it catches because it's ground straight in at a 90 degree angle and they put it on both sides. So you're not relying on just one finger gripping it. 
you're relying on your thumb and your finger. You're getting it from both sides. You're increasing that. It just, it makes it really easy. The GEC is only on one side, but it's deep enough and it's at a 90 degree angle. It really catches your thumb nail rather than it skating off. So from a size perspective, let's see. We've got a blade that is not that big. This is on the small side for me. This is about as small as I go for an EDC. Um, Size-wise, it's probably right around, yeah. I mean, it's right rare with the Rough Rider Reserve. Handles a little longer, which is nice, because here I'm, I'm barely getting it. And it's not just the extra length here, it's the girth, giggity. Um, this is a thicker knife. It's taller this way, it's thicker this way, and it's a quarter inch longer. So I actually can get, even though it doesn't stick out of the bottom of my hand as much, there's more to grab onto here. So that's actually, for a little knife, that's actually a very comfortable uh, grip. I definitely like that. But overall length of the long blade is just under six and a half. That'll compare to just about six and an eighth for that little guy. And we're looking at a three inch blade and six and uh, five eighths, almost six and three quarters on the lion steel. Oh, Jesus Christ. That's what happens when they're slick and I got oil on my hands from oh, <laughs> pulling out the new knife. Let's see how it compares to the GEC bullet, or the Remington bullet by GEC. That one's just a little bit bigger, a little bit bulkier. So this is about as small as I like to go. You know, if I'm if I'm feeling gentlemanly and I want to feel fancy, you know, I'll carry my one of my little gentleman's folders. Really love this guy. Really nice snap on that. But these GECs, man, and the lion steel, like these are kind of like the cream of the crop, at least as far as my traditional knives go. And I know there's a some guy out of England or Ireland or Scotland, Jack something, like his knives are super popular. They go on sale and everybody's waiting for weeks as there's a countdown on Blade HQ where they'll get a shipment. They're gone. I don't know if I'll ever get my hands on one of those, but I've heard they are sublime. They are superb. But I really do like these GECs and that's the difference. You know, we talk about Chinese knives and, you, you know, I, I buy a Chinese knife for $59 and this is better than, I haven't seen a case knife that was put together this well, honestly. Even some of the ones that are over $100. The fit and finish is nowhere as good. The blades are wobbly. They're not on washers. You know, it's like they don't care. They're, they're selling it because, oh, it's case and it's an American tradition. And some collectors, I guess that still means something to. But the steel's inferior. The materials are inferior. The fit and finish is inferior. The quality overall is inferior. You're paying two, sometimes three times as much of what you pay for this and... You're not getting anything for that money other than, I guess, the pride of saying I own something made in America. Well, I'm sorry. That's not good enough for me. If it's made properly and it's a piece of quality, then I will spend my money on something made in America. And that's where I, I like the, the, the GECs. These guys are making things that are much more on par with, and in some ways, I guess, better, but certainly in the same group as you'd put your Boker tree, your German, not the not the uh, import stuff, the Chinese Bokers, but the Salinge in Germany stuff made in the original factory there. You know, the Lion Steel. Lion Steel, the Italian maker, makes phenomenal quality knives. These things are awesome. But if you want to go American, what are your choices? If you want to, if you want a quality. There's plenty of American brands you can buy. But if you want a traditional knife made by traditional style craftsmen using traditional materials and you want it to be made right, and that's the difference, Case checks some of those boxes. American Steel, American Workers, American Process, you know, whatever. They don't have anything that could touch this. Like MC Hammer said, you can't touch this. You can't touch this. So what I would do is get your big baggy genie mc hammer pants on down to your local knife store if they've got you know a gec and you're you're of the 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 type uh, a person that likes that really nice traditional american quality you like that look and feel you like the nostalgia just like you know having a, an old triumph or an old uh, you know whatever an old bonneville bsa there's guys that like you know that that kind of stuff i don't typically like the actual old bikes because old bikes come with lots of problems uh, trying to keep them running. <laughs> but 
you know, there's no difference between this knife and something that would have been made 80 years ago. They're making it in a traditional way. I mean, I don't know if there's any CNC machining or anything like that here. Um, I think it's all done by hand from what I've seen, but um, it, it's absolutely gorgeous. That is a gorgeous little knife. So is this bullet. I really like that trapper design. I like having that that pointy, good slicey blade. But then there's times where, you know, you might want your, uh, you know, you're doing a different kind of cutting and you want that blunted tip. So you're doing some fine work and you need to do some slicing, skinning game, I think is probably what that's for, or cutting off your, your bull, bull balls or whatever. But you don't want to poke a hole in something. So if you're doing using it you know, for hunting or any kind of thing like that, where you're doing some delicate slicing, but you don't want to accidentally poke a hole and rupture something, that's where you would use this blunted point. Um, that's where that kind of comes into play. I love that. For a general little pocket knife, you know, you got your, your whittling blade, you got your bigger blade that you can use for cutting packages or, you know, whatever it is you're doing. But then you've got these redundant blades um, where you need to do more of a utility type of cut. You got that point that's really good for a precise like scalpel. I mean, it is. It's like an X-Acto knife where you want to do that precision cut. You got that. You know, when you're doing something else and you want to have that, okay, I need to do a little bit of slicing, but again, I want to be careful not to poke a hole in something. So you're just shaving something or whatever and you don't want to puncture. Then you got that guy. That's a beautiful, beautiful setup. I really like the shape. I find that some of the Stockmans are just, the blades rub together. These ones don't appear to be rubbed. That's another thing. You know, on those case knives, those blades are all over the place. They're rubbing each other. They're all scratched and scuffed, which doesn't affect how it works. And some people are like, hey, it's a knife. Use it. Who cares? I get it. But to me, you know, a, a friend of mine, I haven't talked to him in years, uh, Hugh, he, um, He's a bit of a curmudgeon. He's a bit of a stickler. Likes things his way. We've certainly had our disagreements over the years. He was a former Army Ranger and knew him in the SCA. And we got to be good friends. And he was a really good teacher and mentor and stuff. But he definitely had his his way about him, if you will. But, you know, one of the things he said to me and his dad taught him was, you know, it takes just as much time and effort to do something the wrong way as it does to do it the right way. <laughs> so a lot of times you think you're cutting corners, but you're not, you know. Making sure that the spacing in here is fine and making sure the blades are at the right angle so that they all open unhindered, they're not rubbing on each other. It doesn't really take much more time and effort than putting them in to get that together incorrectly. So why not do it the right way? And that's what these guys do. A lot of American knife makers, I'm not talking about the small custom shops, I'm talking about the bigger companies and stuff. A lot of their stuff is exported out. You know, If it is made here, it's hard to find anything under $100 that's worth a damn. These aren't under $100. That's the difference. This was $190. This was $160. So you can get nice quality American stuff, but you're going to have to pay for it. And that's the difference. If you don't want to pay for it, then go look at the Rough Rider Reserves. Not the Rough Rider. I mean, the Rough Riders are okay if you want to spend $20. But if you want to spend closer to $50 or $60, get the Rough Rider Reserves. If that's your budget, these knives are excellent. They are outstanding value. It's good quality D2 steel. The grades, the blades are beautifully ground. They use phosphor bronze washers. It's not just the metal of the steel blade rubbing on the on the brass liner that over a while, if there's any blade play, it's going to get worse. You got micarta. There's no proud pins. The transitions are beautiful. Everything about this is quality. Is it on this level? No, but it's not far off. If you didn't see China on the blade and U.S. here, you'd feel this and go, yeah, this one feels a little nicer. And maybe the, there's a little more refinement on some of the grinds and stuff. But the action, the blade play, the polishing, the, the transitions, how well everything's put together, you wouldn't think that this knife was almost four times as much. You, you wouldn't. You'd have to know that going in. So there's a place for the budget knives. Cannot recommend Rough Rider Reserve enough. Cannot recommend these guys enough. I love Lion Steel. I've got four or five Lion Steel knives. Every one of them is a beautiful, high quality, high tech work of art. Even when they're doing the traditional Barlow style, it's still high tech and, and cool. You can get traditional wood and some other things, but 
I love my bokers. But that's not what we're here to talk about. I'm just telling you these are the classes. This is the this is the the environment in which these knives live. Maybe not that one. But GEC makes some nice stuff. I'm going to carry this. I see this in my pocket a bunch. I love that little package. This is I mean, this is just perfect for zipping open Amazon packages or cutting a piece of leather, you know, whatever. It, it's just that little blade is just it is and I'm telling you, man. That is a freaking scalpel. You gotta be careful with a knife like that. But it's beautiful. The bone, just so well executed. I shot this one in 4K because I wanted you guys to really see the detail of this knife. But it's just, it's an exceptional, exceptional knife. And it should be for damn near $200. <laughs> It was like 183 plus tax or something. So it came out to like 190 something. I sold a pit bull stand yesterday to somebody, had extras. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to treat, treat yourself. I'm like, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to take a look and see if they've got any GECs in stock. And they did. And I grabbed one. And I'm very, very happy with it. So anyway, the model was that. So if you're wondering exactly what it is, yeah, I'd say, you know, go buy one if you want one. They've got some in stock, but it's not listed on their website. So you probably have to call them and see if they would ship it to you. Or if you're local and you want a real piece of quality American collectible heirloom quality pocket knife, check it out, y'all. It's for some really nice stuff. I'm glad I lucked out. I've been wanting one for a long time, probably about a year. This is the closest I ever got. For some reason, these ones don't seem to be because I think they're they're branded as, as Remington, even though they're made by, um, by Great Eastern Cutlery for them. But it's really a Remington knife. So I think a lot of people just kind of eh and, and glance over it. So it's not your stereotypical GEC. But this one is. So anyway, that's enough of me gushing over this, but... I, you know, I've been very, yeah, people say I'm negative towards the, uh, you know, the American knives. I'm not. I'm against the American cheap knives and just buying because, oh, it's American. If I'm going to be buying, if I'm going to spend any money on something, it's got to be something decent. And a lot of the Chinese knives are. But once in a while, I find one here in the States and I'm like, you know what? I gots to have that. And now I do. So there you have it. You got any questions, thoughts, throw them in the comments.